Good evening, brothers and sisters. I'm so proud to be with you. Thank you so much. SEIU 1199, West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky. I am so proud to be with you. I have to tell you, Becky, that was one of the most moving and powerful speeches I've seen you give in my entire history in the union. Um, I thank you for opening this space. Um, I come to learn from this leadership team in this union about how we can help every member of our union and the millions of workers that we are trying to galvanize in the most powerful force for change about how each and every fight that we're in on our own behalf as working people, but on behalf of our LGBT brothers and sisters, on behalf of the Black Lives Matter movement and the immigration justice movement and the climate justice movement, you in this room are gonna help teach us how to lead the way in making those connections so that our members understand we can't have fights inside of the workplace and win unless we unite that fight with a powerful force for change for every fight uh, for justice. And I'm so proud that you're opening this space. So let me tell you what informs my leadership. Um, I was born uh, into a family of 10 children, and I'm the oldest girl which means you know, little <laughs> brothers and sisters, what that means. Um, but here's the real thing. My mom gathered us every night and told us Bible stories and had us pray together. And frankly, now that I'm a little older, I believe she did that for one minute of peace and quiet for herself. <laughs> but I have to tell you what those stories made me wonder was how in the heck can you get water from a stone? <laughs> And don't tell me that 10 loaves and fishes can feed thousands. And I have to tell you, my mother was so patient and so um, able to help us begin to imagine how having faith that the seemingly impossible things could be possible in our lives, that it imbued in me an incredible commitment and a belief that when we decide to act together, there's nothing we can't do. That's right. That's and um, I had a lived experience of that, where when my nine brothers and sisters and I made a decision to do something together, <laughs> that turned out to be true. And so these early lessons of faith were then connected to my 33 years inside this great gift of an organization called SEIU where I had the experiences of the personal acts of courage that you've heard from Becky, from Lynn, and Kathy already tonight that added up to becoming our powerful force for change. And you have the mission statement here, but I wanted to remind you of our vision for a just society that we adopted at the 2012 convention. And the sentinel thing I want to have you pay attention to in this room is that our union recommitted ourselves to fighting not to just make sure work had value, but to make sure every human being had respect. And I want to submit to you that those two things have to go together. That we can't insist that home care work has value without ensuring that every person has respect. That's right. That African American women who have historically done this work <laughs> were excluded from the Social Security Act, excluded from the Fair Labor Standard Act, because that work was done primarily by black women. And at the time those acts were passed, Southern legislators weren't going to allow access to those benefits and protections. And, and Becky told you the rest. But Unless we fight for the respect for every human being, we can't insist that all work is valued, especially in the service sector, brothers and sisters. And so I was incredibly proud when our union threw open the doors and said that we were going to have to have a fight for justice on every front in order to win at the bargaining table in the way that working people deserve once and for all, sisters and brothers. And that, that made me understand that the threats 
to our ability to win this just society are rooted in the kinds of oppression you've already heard. And I want to give you three stories about that. When I was a young girl, um, I, I lived in an integrated neighborhood where it was black and white children playing together all the time. And I don't know if you have a picture in your mind of when, when little kids, multiracial groups, how much love and care that, that children are realize the best of their humanity before the lie gets imprinted, as Becky told us. And so I had this um, instinctive res response when my black girlfriend was being mistreated. And I wanted to go rush and object. And I have this memory of my mother putting her hand on my chest and not letting me step in and object. And I remember being totally shocked because my mother was a really good person. And I learned to be quiet as a white person and to not object. And it was the way in which I now understand that racism is held in place because my silence and the silence of my good white people is used to not object systematically. And I think one of the things that's so incredibly hopeful about the moment we're in is that young people are in the streets saying, eh, eh, no more, no how. We're going to expose the lie and tear down racism. I'm, I'm proud that our unions made a decision that we have to link the fight to eliminate racism with the fight for economic justice, because right. we are not going to achieve economic justice without making that happen. <laughs> the second story I wanted to tell you is fast forward from when I was four to uh, when I was first organizing um, nursing home workers in 1980. And um, I was in Fresno, California, and the employer put a leaflet out that I was a lesbian in the hopes that the organizing committee that I had been working with, which was Filipinas, African Americans, and white women primarily, as you know, uh, would be afraid and not trust me, was the, as you can imagine, the innuendo. Well, I'm proud to say that um, I had had the, I had been taught a bad lesson in Minnesota when I was organizing a nursing home and the same thing happened to me and it didn't occur to me, frankly, to say that I was um, to the workers and it stopped the campaign. But this time in Fresno, I knew that I had to say something from the very beginning because the boss was gonna use it to defeat the union. And so you and I know that the individual acts of courage when LGBT people come out to their coworkers helps break down the barriers that people feel and that we begin to connect each other. But Becky told this story too about how the employer uses difference uh, to divide us. And then the third story I wanted to tell you was um, in early 2013, right after the first fast food strike in, in uh, Brooklyn, New York, when there was this demand for 15 in a union, I was making a presentation at the Center for American Progress with a bunch of economists and a lot of progressive national organizations were in the room. And I talked about that demand for 15 in a union by fast food workers, and this woman came up to me at, at when I was done and pulls me aside and says, now you don't really believe that people who flip burgers for a living deserve to earn that much. <laughs> so this is another way in which barriers are created and people are thought as not worth it, taken it a grant for granted, and I would submit when Becky calls on us to talk about changing hearts and minds, that what fast food, home care, child care, airport workers are doing all across this country is changing hearts and minds to the point of saying, why not 15 right. for those people who work for the richest multinational right. corporations in the world? Why not $15? And that's why I wanted to show you that for me, this discussion tonight 
is not about what we do to help somebody else. This, is, this discussion tonight is about how we realize the fullness of our own humanity and that we're going to be able to get it back as a result. And so this is what the, we're going to look at in the, as we come to the convention. I wanted to locate it. These are three strategies that we're going to begin to consider throughout the union this fall. And I just spoke about fast food workers. And the idea here is, can we imagine for the 64 million people that labor in the service and care sector in this country that earn less than 15, can we imagine a form of collective power and bargaining for 4 million fast food workers that don't have to organize and bargain one franchise store at a time, but do what they've done in Denmark and Australia and South Africa and Brazil and have a national collective bargaining agreement that covers all four million and raises the, raises the floor and then sweeps across the service sector to home care and child care. Like, what can we do that will really change the game and create a powerful political organization? And we don't believe we can do that without simultaneously committing ourselves to do what Becky is calling us to tonight which is building a wider movement that's committed to fighting for justice on every front. Because workers in that organization are black, are immigrant, are LGBT, care about the climate. How do we help be, bring the fullness of who we are uh, into these fights? And that's why we want to commit ourselves to building the wider movement for economic, social, and right now in the union, and I'm interested in your reaction to this, we've inserted racial justice because of the particular way in which we think we need to educate our member leaders across race on how the racism targeted towards African Americans in this country needs to be uniquely understood by all of us so we can take responsibility for rooting out the source of the structures that are holding us all down. Right. So, and then the third thing is as we do those two things, we cannot build the next thing and build the wider movement without transforming who we are inside our own unions. And so the third thing we have to do is partly what Becky's making us, challenging us to do tonight, is how do we transform the work she said on hearts and minds at home, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, and in building the wider movement? How do, how do we weave that into the day-to-day -day work that you're doing so that your coworkers understand that this isn't some crazy fight that some crazy woman thought we should have, but is required for us to win on a scale that is going to make us realize the Becky world? or the, ver the world, right, that we all imagine. How can we win the just society if we don't link arms with all the justice fights across the country? So I really look forward to hearing from uh, each of you and, and Professor Powell and then a discussion if we are able to have it because sisters and brothers like you, I am rooted in a faith and a commitment that we can make the impossible possible. We stand on the shoulders of people that have done it in our own union. The Cabell Huntington Hospital birthed this organization. Immigrant flat janitors did it in, uh, for SEIU 90 years ago. And tonight, we are at the beginning of a movement that's going to unite the fight that working people have had in this union with a fight for justice on every front. Thank you all very much.